Nehemiah chapter 4 is where we are. And when you have it, will you just stand with me and let us read together. And we stopped at verse, I believe, 8 last time. So we're going to actually just backtrack to 7 and then move forward. Nehemiah chapter 4, we begin to read at verse 7. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead, and that the gaps were being closed, they were angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is given out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the walls. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and their spears and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, and that God had frustrated it, we all return to, to the wall, each to our own work. And I'm going to stop right there. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, we, your people, stand in your presence, longing, yearning, listening to what you have to say. So speak to us, Lord. I pray that our hearts, our minds, and every part of our being will listen, will pay attention, will be attentive to what you say to us today. So speak, Lord, as we wait on you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. And I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, knowing what is at stake. Knowing what is at stake. We're still in the process of rebuilding. Knowing what is at stake. In the last sermon that I preached, we noted that Sambalat, and Tobiah and the others came with insults and they came with mockery and they heaped all of this on Nehemiah and the Jews as they rebuilt the walls. But we also noted that even in spite of all of that, despite all of that, they were not phased by it. And if you remember in our last sermon, I said to you, their response, Nehemiah's response was, so we built the wall. So, so what? 
So we built the wall. So you dunk on us. But your dunking didn't throw us off of our game. Because on the other end of the court, we shot a three-pointer. And we got the foul shot also. In other words, what you did over there didn't affect what we did over here. You can give it, Sambala. You can give it, Tobiah. You can heckle us. You can laugh at us. You can dunk all you want on us. And we will keep hitting the three-pointers and taking the hard foul and building on the score. And by the time the game is finished, we're going to come out on top. And that's just what they did. They kept on building. They kept on working to build the wall. But I want you to see something as we move forward here. Just because you ignore the opposition, just because you ignore the enemy does not mean he will go away. In fact, if you will remember, after Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, after Jesus refused to give in to the challenge that Satan had propositioned him, after Jesus refused to give in to the invitation to worship or to take God for granted after the devil finished tempting him. Luke 14 tells us that the devil left him for a more opportune time. In other words, Satan left him looking for a better opportunity when he will return. And I want us to know that Satan is always looking for a perfect opportunity to break you and I. The enemy is always looking to shame you, to discourage you, to get you to buy into his plot. You see, God has something for you. God has something for me. It's called a plan. But Satan also has something for you. It's called a plot. Uh, see, a plan is a, a, a conscious detail idea or or a decision for doing or achieving something that otherwise may not become a reality but a plot on the other hand is a secret conspiracy to do something illegal or to cause harm and that's what the enemy is always working on but God has a plan for our lives and so I, I want you to see something here it tells us, but when Sanbala, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were angry. We talked about some time ago in the message that you have to cancel the access that the enemy has. You got to cancel the access the enemy has to your life. You got to close up the gaps. But when they realized that the gaps were closing and being closed, they became angry and they all plotted to come and to fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble. Ignoring the enemy doesn't cause him to stop or cease from plotting. Just because you ignore your critics, just because you ignore them won't cause them to cease. Yes, there are going to be conversations that will happen that you have to act like you didn't hear. There are going to be comments that you have to block out. There are some criticisms that you have to ignore and especially Sometimes when you are in a position like myself as a leader or you are leading in some capacity or other or you have there are times when you will need to block out certain things that you would need to ignore some certain things. 
You can't go chasing every comment. You can't go chasing every criticism that is level at you. But that doesn't mean that it'll stop. Doesn't always mean it will cease. Because one of the things that we have to recognize as, as people and even as believers, that not everyone's going to like you. Not everyone will care for your leadership style. No, not everyone will care about who you are. Not everyone will agree with you. Not everyone will follow you. Not everyone will like your post. You will not be a hit with everyone. If you do good, guess what? You're going to be criticized. And if you do wrong, they're going to hang you out to dry. But if you stay focused on Christ and stick with the call, you will get to the place, you hear me now, where you don't allow negative comments to unseat you or to hinder you or get you to a place where they penetrate your armor. Listen, the Bible tells us the shield of faith works wonders. Will you turn me down in, in, in the monitors? Something is coming back here too high. Listen, the shield of faith works wonders in times when the opposition is even coming at its worst or maybe at its best, depending on how you look at it. Because the Bible tells us that the shield of faith quenches the fiery darts of the wicked. So we are called to keep our faith alive, keep our faith sharp. And here is the thing that we cannot, we don't want to, or we can't afford to allow the enemy to outsmart us and to outwit us. Jesus told the 12, 12 of his disciples when he was preparing to send them out. Listen to what he said. He said to them, I am sending you as sheep among wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. As a believer, as a Christian, as a leader, wisdom and vigilance goes a long way in safeguarding your faith and your relationship with Christ. When Nehemiah got wind of the plot that the enemies were putting together. It tells us that they turn to prayer. Prayer, though, is not all they did. And as I told you last week, that sometimes faith is not enough. Sometimes Praying is not always enough. And you're wondering why I'm saying that. You have to put action to your faith. Are you with me? You mean if I pray and I pray that that's not enough? You mean if I have faith that that's not enough? In the book of James, James says, Listen, you want to demonstrate your faith. You say you have faith, but where is the work? Show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, I wonder what, you, what, what happens here. It tells us that Nehemiah said, we prayed. You see that in verse 9? We prayed and we posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. Since they were ignored and the work wasn't halted, these haters, 
been plotted to go to Jerusalem and to fight. In other words, if what we say won't stop you, they were saying, we will do something to stop you. We will come and we will fight you. We will put an end to all of it. Those who oppose the work, The enemies knew what was at stake. Walk with me. They knew what was at stake. But those who were working inside also knew. You see, the enemy knew that if the walls were rebuilt to the city, that they would not have any more easy access to it. The opposition knew that if the faith of the people become stronger and they begin to worship their God the way they used to worship their God, the God whom these enemies feared, if they begin to worship and sacrifice and restore and they have faith again and Jerusalem begins to be rebuilt again, it may once again become a, a vibrant and a thriving community and the enemies didn't want that. They feared that. They knew what was at stake. And here's the question. And, and in fact, not a question. Nehemiah said, we prayed and we posted a guard to meet the threat. We not only prayed, but we took action. We didn't just say we had faith, but we took action. And watch this. The question that I have for you is this morning is do you know what is at stake? Do you know what is at stake in your life? Are you aware of the things that threatens your that threaten your faith? Are you aware of what might be threatening what you teach your children? Are you aware of what might be threatening how you raise your children? Are you aware of the things that threat that threatens your lifestyle? The things that are at stake. Are you aware of what is at stake? Are you aware of the things that might be threatening your livelihood? Do you know what is threatening your righteous standard of living? Are you aware of the things that might threaten your relationship with Jesus Christ? You see, when you know what is at stake, when you understand what is at stake, you will design your response to match the threat. Am I preaching too high for you? Are you with me? When you, when, when, when you understand what is at stake in your life, when you understand the things that are at stake, you will design your response to meet the threat. Nehemiah said, but we prayed and we prayed posted a guard and, 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 and notice this before I go on he said we did it in the earlier chapters that we were reading we see him making prayers alone he prayed alone he was praying to God he, every time something happened he prayed and he was alone in his prayers but here as the plot thickens as he realizes what is at stake it's not just him praying alone now he said we prayed it's all of us praying together see when you know what is at stake you change your approach and you change your strategy you don't do all the praying and the fighting alone when the plot thickens you got to call up the troops you got to get together the bible said two is better than one here yeah? and it one, isn't that what it says? Two is better than one. One can chase a thousand, but two can put 10,000 to flight. Hallelujah. Two can put 10,000 to flight. 
It's better when you get someone around you, when you realize the plot is thickening, when you realize what is at stake and what the enemy is trying to do to you, you need to get in a place where we can get some associates, we can get some people to pray. You need to some praying people around us who can pray with us. That's what Nehemiah did. He said, we prayed together. We prayed, but that's not all we did. We posted a guard. We posted a guard. We posted a guard because we realized that the threat was real. We prayed and we acted. We took precaution against the enemy's threat. He prepared himself and he prepared the people. Listen, there are some things that God can do and will do alone. In other words, that God will move and sometimes he doesn't need anyone doing anything. But there are times that we have to move. We have to do. We need the right course of action and we need to know when to apply it. And prayer helps in both places. You can't just say, we can't just say we have faith and do nothing. But we can take the right course of action because knowing what to do, when to do it is important. And oftentimes, the revelation does not come without prayer. Nehemiah prayed He said, we prayed and we posted a guard. Here's something else I want you to see. Look at verse 10 very closely. It says, meanwhile, in the meantime that we are aware of the threat and in the meantime that we are posting a guard and in the meantime While we're getting ready to meet this threat, he said, the strength of the laborers is given out. This is what the people said. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. In other words, halfway through the building process, their strength began to wane. And they began to complain about the rubble that was getting in the way. The same rubble, let me remind you, that was there when they begun because if you remember when Nehemiah heard the news and he asked and he inquired about Jerusalem the first time his brother and those who had come back from Jerusalem when he was still in the citadel responded to him and they said the Jerusalem has been is the walls are broken down and the gates have been burned with fire so the rubble was there the the walls that were broken down were still there and watch this I, 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 you know when when we first receive Christ as our lord and savior and you guys can agree with me you can I, I, um you can testify to this when we first receive Christ as our savior there is an excitement that happens. Yeah? We're, we're, we're so excited because we're, we receive God. It's, it's like there's nothing short of a miracle and we have so much joy and we're excited and we, we, we become proponents of, 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 of um, the faith and we are encouraging people and we talk about salvation and we want to tell people about Jesus and how God changed our lives and how Jesus came into our hearts. But I don't know, somewhere along the line, I don't want to say it's halfway through, but somewhere along the line, it seems that something happens somewhere on the journey and the problems of life becomes even more threatening to us or real to us. Life eventually seems to get to us and the rubble gets our attention then. And we begin to slowly lose our punch and our passion. But this is the place, this is the part, this is the place when we need to double down. This is the place when you and I need to double down and do all that is possible to help us to maintain and to keep our spiritual passion and fire alive. 
You see, the rubble was there all the time. It was there from the beginning. In fact, the rubble was always there. But they didn't pay attention to it because they had the, the zeal. When Nehemiah said, let's rebuild, they said, come on, let us rebuild. And they were eager to rebuild the wall. They were excited. They were passionate about something. They wanted to rebuild the walls. But then, as the opposition increased, the rubble got their attention. The rubble got their attention. It's like when we are, we, we're so excited about serving God, but then we, we, we run into, we encountered problems and the, that, that major obstacle that we, we, we run into or major trouble. Then we look inward and then we notice that there are some things that need our attention because they are getting in the way of our progress. It could be that there is some unfinished business from the past, anger issues, abandonment, trauma, but the rubble emerges. And when the opposition begins to weary us, we lose our excitement and the rubble then becomes the object of our focus. Then we begin to major on the minor. Then we begin to look at all the negative aspects of life. We begin to observe the negative things and the rubble that once inspired us to do something to change our lives, to do something to know Jesus. The rubble that once inspired us to do something to get healthier, to do something to get out of debt. The rubble that wants inspire us to do something that, that, that we, we thought we couldn't do. We worked around it. We worked with it. Something to do. We were trying to do something about our lives. When we saw the rubble, we said, no, 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 no. I've got to change this. I've got to do something about it. And we begin to work around it and work. And it was still there. But then when trouble comes, that same rubble then becomes the object of our focus. The very thing that inspired us to do better then becomes the very thing that we begin to focus on. And when we do it, discouragement sets in. The temptation to stop building on what we know to be right, what we know to be true the temptation to stop building our lives, the temptation to quit our jobs, the temptation to quit our posts, the temptation to quit our families, the temptation to quit the church seems more alluring and the rubble appears to be getting the better of us. That's what was happening. The rubble, now they were focused. We can't build because there is too much rubble. But it's the same rubble that was there when they started. It was the same rubble that they looked at and it inspired them to do something different, to change. But with the pressing of the opposition, now they see the problem. And if I might say this, it is always better to deal with the rubble earlier than later. We deal with the problem when it shows as a problem. Because how many of us know that if we allow the rubble, if we leave the rubble, if we ignore it, it will fester. It will gather momentum. And, it, 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 and if left alone, it becomes bigger, a bigger risk factor in our lives. And later, that same rubble will zap our strength, it will take a bigger toll on our lives and we are encouraged when we see what happens here with Nehemiah to pay attention to the rubble because sometimes we can ignore the rubble thinking that if we ignore it if we work around it, it will eventually go away 
wrong. It won't go away. Some point we have to deal with it. At some point, it will slow our progress. And at some point, and guess what? And sometimes the rubble shows up at some of the worst times in our lives. Just when we don't want it to show up. And it couples with other problems and then it becomes bigger than we can battle it alone. And we need help. The problem is that under and aside even from the blessings that God is pouring in our lives and helping us, that there is a dark component operating on the other on the other end to oppose us and to hinder us. And if the rubble is left unchecked, it'll hinder our progress. How many of you know that constant opposition can wear you down? Constant opposition can, can lead to a loss of joy. Constant opposition can lead us to a pit of depression. Constant opposition can lead us to suicidal thoughts. Constant opposition can lead to confusion and even loss of purpose and a shift in our focus. And in those times, if the rubble is just left alone, it will become a total distraction because opposition without can lead to up to dejection within. Are you with me? Discovering how to handle opposition and remove the rubble is a problem that we cannot ignore so that it does not become an issue later in the building process as we're building or a roadblock block to our com com completion or completing the wall. So how do we do that? Let me leave a couple things with you. How do we do that? Nehemiah said the way we responded is we prayed and we posted a guard. We acted on what we know it was right and necessary to remain vigilant and to retain our strength and to retain our passion and, and, and to finish what God started in us. Nehemiah here, and I want to show you, and we're going to walk through this. Nehemiah here in verses 13 through 14, he details for us how the guard was posted. Watch this. With me. Therefore, Nehemiah said, because of the threat, because of what we were hearing and the threat to rebuilding the walls, he said, therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places. We talked about this in an earlier sermon about stopping the access. He said, posting them by families, watch this, with their swords, their spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families and your sons and your daughters, your wives and your home. Now, I know that's a lot that I just read, but stay with me and let me extract some things for you. Some truths that I believe that will help us. How do you stay alert? How do you stay focused? How do you keep progressing? When the enemy is threatening to come and kill you. When the enemy is threatened to come and destroy the very things that you're trying to build. How do you stay focused? How do you keep progressing? Here's a couple things I want to give you. Number one, protect your areas of weakness. Protect your areas of weakness and limit your exposure to negative influences. Mm -hmm. 
protect your areas of weakness and limit your exposure to negative influences. And how do I do that? By associating and positioning the right people in your life at the points where they have the necessary knowledge and tools to help you navigate those weaknesses and meet the challenges. Stopping, protecting the areas of weakness. You know, when I first got into management and leadership, I was afraid of having people around me who were smarter than I was. I felt threatened by that. But I had to learn and eventually learn that I need the right people at the right post, in the right position to really succeed. Watch me. We need the right people at the right post, in the right positions for the kingdom of God to benefit. And and see, if if they are smarter than I am, I had to learn that. If they are smarter than I am, then it benefits me to use their smarts and their wisdom. I don't have to feel threatened by it. I don't have to feel threatened because you know more than I do. I don't have to feel threatened because you have some tools that I don't have. I don't have to feel threatened because you are better in this area than I. I can't be good at everything, right? None of us can be. And it's learning how to utilize and to use what God gives us and those people that, that, that are in our lives to benefit, and, and, and especially in the areas where you're weak. Because in the areas where you are weak, someone else may be strong. And that's the, pl- that's the person that you need to put in that area to help you. Are you with me? Are you with me? And what Nehemiah said is, I play, he said, I place the people in the positions because that's where we needed them. In the places of weaknesses, you have to protect your areas of weakness. The second thing I want to give to you is this. Nehemiah said, Not only did we post the guards at the exposed places, he said, he tells the people, do not be afraid of them. The threat is out there. The threat is coming. They threaten to come kill us, but you cannot be afraid. They may be bigger than you. They may be more than you. But don't be afraid. It's the same thing he said to Joshua. Joshua, you're going into the promised land. And you are going to face some armies that are coming at you. He said, but do not be afraid. And do not be discouraged. He said, get into my word. Meditate on it day and night. And do not be afraid. And every time Joshua faced an army. And every time the armies got bigger and bigger. God reminded him. And he said, Joshua, do Do not be afraid. Even though the armies are getting bigger, even though the opposition is expanding in our lives, we cannot afford to be afraid and tuck our tails and run, but we can stand strong. That's why the Bible tells us put on the whole armor of God and learn how to stand in the evil day. And I haven't done all. He said, stand, stand, stand. Don't run. Stand. When you know who is on your side, when you, that's right, when you know who is on your side, you can stand. When you know who's fighting for you, you can stand. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where as a young person, you were opposed by someone and you were in a fight 
And the only reason you knew that you couldn't beat the person that was challenging you, but the only reason you had a whole lot of mouth and the only reason you boasted is because your big brother or your big sister was there. And they were going to fight your battle for you. And it gave you the confidence. You weren't afraid. When you know who's fighting for you, when you know that God is on your side, when you know that God will deliver you, when you know that God is going to stand up for you, like he told them this, he said, I will go with you, I will fight for you, and I will give you the victory. When you know who's going to give you the victory, when you know who has the victory in your, in your head, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. He said, don't be afraid. Watch this. Number three, he says, he wants us to know. Nehemiah says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Don't be afraid of them. What he heard was the people were saying, that these enemies who live close to us, they brought the words that these were the, the, the Jews who live outside of Jerusalem. And they brought in and they said to Nehemiah, they are saying that they are going to come and they're going to attack us when we least expect. And they're going to kill us and they're going to stop the work. Nehemiah said, remember who's fighting for you. In other words, he was saying to them, you've got to weigh what the opposition and the enemies are saying against what you know to be true of God. And should I say that again? You need to weigh the opposition, what the opposition is, is saying against what you know to be true of God. The enemy will tell you, you can't do it. But you've got to know that God says, with God, all things are possible. The enemy is saying you can't sustain it, but you can remember that God said, I will be with you. Are you with me? It, it's, it's what you know to be th true about God and not just what God has said, but what God has already done in your life. What, what, what you have is not just words, but you have the testimony of what God has done in your life. That's why it's important that... It, I believe it's a songwriter says that each victory will help us some other to win. In other words, when I look at what I've come through, when I look at what God has already done for me, I am sure that this next battle, this next fight, this next opposition will be no match for the same God that has already brought me through. He can take me through this one, that one, and everything that I face. It's no win. Weighing what the enemy says against what God says and against who God is. The Bible says, greater is he that is, greater is he that is than he that is in the world. The, the, the greater one, in other words, the greater one lives in you. And watch this. He says, don't forget. The God that you serve. In other words, the God who is great and awesome. Do not forget. Here's the next thing. Know, and I said this earlier. This is the topic of my message. Number four, you have to know what is at stake. Hear me. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. Nehemiah said to them, no, remember the God who is great and awesome amongst you. And he says, and fight for your families, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your home. In other words, know why you do what you do. Know what you are fighting for. Make sure you are doing it for the, wrong, for the right reasons. 
Do you know, as a question I have for you this morning, do you know what is at stake in your role as whatever role you are? Whether you are a leader, whether you are a pastor, whether you are a mother, whether you are a business leader, whatever you are, a father, whoever you are, do you know what is at stake in your role as a leader? Do you know who you are fighting to protect? Do you know what you are fighting to protect? I know we don't go looking for a fight. They didn't go looking for a fight, but the enemy was threatening to bring the fight to them and the fight was going to find them, but they knew what was at stake and what, when you know what is at stake in your life, it will determine how you fight. Do you hear me? When you know what is at stake, it will determine how you fight. And the Bible, it says, Nehemiah said, I watched it. We posted a guard and we pray. We watch and we pray. We pray and we watch. Listen to me, church. You are responsible, hear me now, for what God has given you. You are responsible for your family. You are responsible for your home. You are responsible for what happens in it. You are responsible for the service you render to God. You are responsible for the work that God has called you to do. You are responsible for the gifts that God has given you and how you use them. You and I, we are responsible for what God has given us. And when that is threatened by the enemy, then we have to put up a fight to retain what belongs to us we sometimes it means that we have to go back and take back what the enemy has taken from us are you understanding me church we can't sit back and say well let the enemy take what belongs to us no it belongs to us and we cannot afford to let the enemy waltz off with it but you got to know what you're fighting for you got to know what is at stake if your joy is at stake you got to fight for it Whatever is at stake in your life and whatever threatens, that will help you to determine what tools you need to use to fight the enemy. If you don't know what is at stake, then you are liable to losing what you have. You are liable to fight with the wrong weapons. Are you with me? You are liable to pick up the wrong weapons. He said, I gave them swords and I gave them spirit and I tell them and I posted them in the places that were where the areas were that were weak and I told them, fight, fight, fight because your children are at stake. Fight because your family's at stake. Fight because you have things that are at stake that you want to hold on to that you don't want to lose. So fight and remember the God who is great and awesome around you. And finally, verse 15 tells us, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all return to the wall, each to our own work. Can I say this in closing? The enemy knows when you are doing the right thing or you're only acting like you're doing the right thing. The enemy knows what is real and he knows what a threat to his kingdom looks like then we ought to know and recognize what a threat to our livelihood and to the kingdom of God looks like. The enemy knows what a real fight looks like. And when our response or responses are rooted in a genuine relationship with God, hear me church, it will frustrate the enemy every time he approaches you and he realizes that you are on guard and that God has hemmed you in. (laughs) 
your faith, your stand, your position as a believer, your faith in God, what you stand for, what you stand up for, how you fight are the things that will frustrate the enemy and will bring you the victory. But we have to know what is at stake because when we know what is at stake, we will fight accordingly. So how are you going to fight? How are you going to meet the challenge? How are you going to fight? Knowing what you are up against. You cannot prepare to meet an enemy that you don't know what he's coming with. That you don't know the weapons. You can't go fighting with certain things when you don't know what is coming at you. You can't go fighting and winning a battle when you don't even know what you're fighting for. How many people get in fights that they don't even know what they're fighting for? You ever seen people just walk up and someone's fighting and they jump in the fight and they don't even know what's going on? But they get in the fight and sometimes you get in the fight, you're in the wrong fight, you get hurt and you don't even know why you got hurt. But you were in the fight. You didn't know what you were fighting for. But when you know what is fighting, what you're fighting for, sometimes you know that my life depends on it. And because I know my life depends on it, I am going to fight to maintain my life. I'm going to fight to maintain my relationship with God. I'm going to fight to stand up as a Christian. I'm going to fight and I will not give up. Church, there are a lot of things that are coming at us in these closing days of times. There are a lot of things that are opposed to us. But we need to know what we're fighting for and hold on to our faith and hold on to our confidence and hold on to our relationship with God and hold on to what matters the most. Knowing what is at stake. Let's pray. eternal God, our Father in heaven. God, as we look around at our own lives, God, help us to, to know and to recognize the things that are important and most important. Help us, Lord God, to know what really counts in the end. Help us to know the things that are valuable and realize what we value the most. We will give our strength to. And if the wrong things are valued the most, that's where we'll put our greatest effort. But if there are things that won't last, if there are things that, that won't stand the test of time, then all our efforts will be in vain. So I pray this morning, God, open our eyes to the realities around us. Open our eyes to the things that threaten our sanity that threatens our faith, that threatens our families, that threatens our home, that threatens our joy, that threatens our position. God, help us so that we can fight valiantly, so that we can fight faithfully, so that we can fight with determination, with skill, and with confidence. God, I pray this morning, see our hearts. Help us to be vigilant and sober and watchful that we do not lose our passion, our fire, our faith, and our love for Jesus Christ. Father, we give you thanks. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray.